Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 242 for Monday, February 3rd, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show, as we said, that is by, for, and about working musicians. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. <laughs> we all, you almost you almost slipped it up again, didn't you? You were, yep. you were ready. I know. I know. You know. What's funny is what was going through my head is what, what were you going to do? So, it, And this is exactly what happens when you come to song lyrics, where as soon as you have to think... It, the disconnection happens, right? It's over. It's, it's yeah. over. It's you over. You know, if I have to think about a lyric and I, and my brain says, okay, you want to think about it? Here are two choices. I will always choose the wrong one. Always. Always. Yeah. Oh, no, we, um, we had a, a monkey fist gig on Saturday night at old rail pizza, which is this great place. It's, it's full of, I, I, I I'm trying to think of the right way to classify this crowd. Non pretentious people that just want to have some fun. Right. Like, yeah, that's how it should be. Right. And it's an acoustic gig. So the conversation sort of, you know, very easy to have the interaction happens. There's always song requests. And usually we sort of go with the flow this week. We had what I'll call the original monkey fist lineup, which is um, John Donahue, Johnny D and me. uh, uh, John sings and plays some guitar and me. And then there's there's this floating guitar player spot spot that's been filled by a lot of people. But. The one that it most usually is and originally was is Jimmy, Jim Laval. And Jim, uh, Jim's a great player. He is unlike Matt Langley, who's the other guy that we usually bring in if uh, Jim's not available. And Matt's the, the guy that that's like your Steve Sayakotos. He just knows every song and he's willing to play mm-hmm. it even if he doesn't know it. Right. And so the the request thing can get a little bit off the rails sometimes with Matty because he's just willing to play anything. Whereas. The other night we did more requests than I think we've ever done as that lineup, but we were a little bit more selective about how we played them and, and they worked out really well. But when, when to, to your point about remembering song lyrics, you know, there's songs that we sing all the time that if I get distracted, I forget the lyrics for the other night, somebody requested that they requested a lot of things. They requested, uh, they kept asking for sticks and it's like, what are you trying to do to us? Like we're a, we're an acoustic mm. outfit and B like who can sing those songs. And, um, and, but we wound up pulling off come sail away. And I had John b- pulled up the lyrics for me. I wound up getting nominated to sing it. And, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> but you know, it's a song that I've probably sung in the car, you know, 150 times or something over the decades that I've known that song. And after looking at the first line, it was like, oh, I know this song. I just sang it. And like there's songs that I've sang, you know, far more recently than that one that I can't just roll out the lyrics to. But that one was like, oh, yeah, no problem. But the pressure's low, right, in that scenario. Everybody knows that you're literally pulling it, you know, (laughs) out of your ass. So like if you mess something up, they're all with you. They're cheering for you. They're rooting you on, you know, and um and there's something to be said for that, the the art of performing, which I think we we don't always nail, but we really nailed the other night. The whole engagement thing and and kind of giving the energy to the crowd so that they could give it back to us. And and it was really, you know, like an all for one, one for all kind of kind of attitude. It was like, all right, let's see what we can try next kind of thing, which which was really right. fun. Yeah. Again, it, you, you probably play with guys. In both ways, there are some guys who literally, you know, this is my art and it needs to be as good as it can be before I deliver it. And so yep. I don't want to do any of that experiment. And, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm no. I'm simply saying I've been that guy sometimes. It depends on the vibe for sure. At yeah. least for me, it does. It depends on the vibe. Yeah. 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 But actually, that one guy, you know, hopefully or two guys or however it may be in your band, if your band decides to do this or your band leader decides to do this. I've also seen that guy be a negative influence on the performance or the attempted performance of a ad hoc song. Right. So that guy's frowning or making kind of a sour face as the rest of the band is trying to have some fun, get through it. That is a, it ruins the fun. And and that's what I, yeah, no, everybody has to be on the same page for that. And, and ideally 
I mean, everybody, not just the band, but the crowd and the, the people that manage the venue. Right. Like and that's that's really the vibe of this place is really everybody is on board. In fact, we had somebody from behind the bar. Uh, she requested. Oh, what was it? Um, uh, oh, go your own way. And we wound up doing it. it, it I, I mostly hit the notes in the chorus, which I was surprised. Pretty high. Y- yeah, yeah, really high. I was it was toward the end of the night, but I wasn't I wasn't burned out, but I was very loose. And, and so I was able to hit them. Uh, but mostly I'm, I'm sure if I heard it back, I'd be like, oh, OK, maybe not quite as well as you thought, Dave. Uh, but um, but, you know, when the like when everybody's in on it and it's all truly all for one, then it, it's really a fun night. So. Um, but, it, but you're right. If you've got somebody that's poo pooing it, especially if it's somebody on stage, but even if it's somebody that's not on stage, that can ruin yeah. the vibe. Yeah. 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 But, uh, I, I, I tend to say, uh, we do requests if we know the song. Sure. Or if everybody can agree, this might not go the way you think it's going to be. Right. Right. Yeah. You need to. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's, that's, yep. <laughs> and yep. I make the disclaimer that one thing we definitely don't want to do is hack to death somebody's favorite song. Right. Right. Which invariably is what would happen. Yeah. It could happen. Times. Could happen. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We always say that. Uh, well, there's there's a couple of catchphrases we use in, in Monkey Fist. One is, you know, be careful what you wish for, because we might actually we might actually do it. Um, yeah. And 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 then that's your fault is what I tell people, not ours, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and and that usually goes over well like that. You know, I mean, again, you got to deliver it the right way. You know, that's not the the thing that everyone should deliver. It, it, it works for me. There are things that other people deliver that wouldn't work for me. But that, you know, that look, this is your fault. If we do this wrong, you know, remember, you asked for this. This wasn't our <laughs> idea. And so that tends to work um, again if you if you can have them with you and it doesn't become adversarial, which that sort of comment easily could go the wrong way. Uh, you've got to deliver it with the right amount of smile on your face. <laughs> I agree. But the other one that I like to say is, you know, as we're sort of setting up the evening, this usually happens earlier in the evening rather than later, is um, I can't guarantee that we can play a song by your favorite band. But what I can guarantee is that we can play a song that your favorite band has heard. And so that usually works out. People like yeah. that. Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know. It's just that, you know, you got to work the crowd. It's it's and you got to read the crowd and know when you can get away with the stuff and when you can't, you know, if it's if it's not an engaged crowd, then playing stuff that you don't know, like like taking those kinds of risks, like the, you know, the Fleetwood Mac, like for us, which is a risk and, and the, the sticks thing, which for us is a risk. Taking those kinds of risks is a bad idea. You know, it needs everybody really needs to be like in with you on it, not ignoring you and, and, you know, drinking their coffee or eating their food or whatever it is. Cause that can get a yep. little weird. Yep. So yeah. Um, that was Saturday night on Friday night. I, I had to go to, well, I had to go to the, the Vermont, New Hampshire border because my son had a hockey game clear on the other side of the state. And we, Lisa and I wound up going just over the border and found this barbecue place, which was like, I'm not used to finding real barbecue places here in New England, but this place was, it was like, you awesome. walk, you walk in, you, you go up to the counter, you order your stuff. Then you go sit at uh, one of a variety of community tables and you just, you know, when your food comes, you just eat it with everybody that's around you. And which is great. Uh, I got very used to those in Texas, but that we don't have them up here other than evidently this one. And there were two guys in the corner playing blues, uh, a guitar player and a bass player. And the guitar player did have like a kick drum in front of him that occasionally he would like feather on the downbeats or whatever. But these guys had the ability to groove hard Uh without a drummer at all. And, you know, blues, you really need that pulse happening. And and man, I mean, these guys, I didn't miss the fact that there wasn't a drummer there at all. In fact, these would have been, you know, I, I thought to myself, man, if I wanted to play blues, these are the cats I want to play with because like <laughs> these guys can drive the bus all by themselves. Like I don't I, I don't have to be like, you know, relegated to that role. That would be that would be fun. So. Do you have a big blues scene in New Hampshire? Um, Not that big. No. Uh, there are there are some blues artists and I think they tend to draw 
okay size crowds, but it's not certainly not like what I experienced down in, you know, in Austin or whatever. Well, you have to take that and set it aside, right? Because right. nothing is really like that, right? That's true. <laughs> Fair. So, yeah. you know, here in the Bay Area, for some reason, and I don't know the reason, I don't know the history that has connected it. There is a, there's like, you know, there's a blues society. There's an all blues club. There's, um, you know, most of the jams are blues jams. Many jams are blues jams. But there's like a real, you know, blues thing here. Yeah. And there's some really um, great, you know, blues players who have had, you know, some level of success recorded some stuff. And sure. Like, do you know who Tommy Castro is? Of course. Nasty Habits. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that, in, that intro. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's some really good blues players that come from here, but blues is a thing. And I'm, it's always funny to me because, you know, the risk of blues is because the bar to entry is pretty low. You get a lot of bad blues. Like that's the you know, thing, you, right? You know, good blues when you hear it, right? You, you know, authentic from the heart, like you said, grooving, you know, swampy yep. blues, right? Yep. And then, you know, you could elevate it to Chuck Berry, you know, style stuff, which, you know, is blues in name, but is, you know, really where blues starts to formalize into rock and roll. But there's a lot of sloppy, you know, I learned my one scale. I'm a blues player type things that um, are hard. And the, and the the weird thing is, like, I think blues, especially in this area, similar to jazz, similar to Steely Dan, is that they have an audience that implies a certain amount of culture if you if you are a fan of it or you know an, sure. a, 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 right uh, but again Steely Dan to me there's some great songs and some brilliance to it but the audience is jazz for people who don't like real jazz and and jazz is often an audience of uh, people who want some sophistication in their music. But, you know, really the the what jazz is to American music is, you know, largely lost on the audience and similar to blues. You know, blues is, you know, often three chords, 12 bars and uh, and, uh, you know, play in the box type guitar playing. But um, and that's where a lot of this stuff is. But, you know, like John Lee Hook, you know, like real blues has a has a life to it that, you know, I would say you actually have to live it in order to to emote it, right? Yeah, um, I, yeah. It, I mean, there's there, there are different levels of the blues. When I when I talk about blues, especially in you know modern day with like a, a band, I think about and and this is totally fueled by my experience. Is I think about more like blues rock, the you know the Stevie Ray Vaughan, the blues rock trio ah. kind of thing. I mean, it, it definitely blues there, but but you you know it's not like Robert Johnson is not right there. You know, we're a few steps removed from Robert Robert Johnson at that at that point. Yeah. You know, but which but still, you like those grooves are the same. It you got to have that that sort of, you know, swampy, like you said, behind the beat, but not sloppy the groove. You know, it's it's a very tight thing. It's, I, it's a fascinating thing playing playing blues with, with people that know how to play blues like that. To me, that's where I really learned about, oh, what I didn't know. And, you know, the, like the other night, this guitar player, he was he was great. He was he had that thing like Stevie Ray had where he could play rhythm and lead kind of yeah. simultaneously slash interchangeably and keep things rolling. Like you never stopped hearing the pulse, even just out of him. And that allows a bass player to play. He doesn't have to play like long, sloppy legato notes, you know, to hold the, the hold it together. He can almost play that kind of tighter walking almost a jazz style bass line that it's that right hand you know it's just that constantly moving shuffling the guitar right player hand. right hand shuffling yeah. yes yeah and then his left hand is sort of you know moving between playing chords and 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 uh and rhythms but you're right his right hand if he just keeps going up and down like you don't it's yeah. like how are the, all those other sounds coming out like your your right hand's doing the same thing but then the bass player can play that that really kind of you know tight walking line that that counteracts that it's the count. It's the perfect counterpart for that. Uh, no, that's what I'm, you're saying. Exactly what I'm trying yeah. to emote. There's actually a, a level of complexity that's almost hard to learn. It's 
it's feel the, right? uh, it's totally feel and the only way i learned it was being on stage in the middle of it realizing i was the one screwing it up or getting in the way uh, yeah right and then it's like oh okay how do i not get in the way like for the future what would be the thing that i'd want to work on and also Less or more importantly, well, right now, what can I do to make this better immediately? You know, and it's just like simplify, follow the bass player, um, you know, in blues, I, it, the, the right kind of blues. And again, I'm using air quotes for right, because there's, you know, there's a lot of different types. But the type that we're talking about here where the guitar player is is kind of driving things. The bass player often plays ahead of the beat. And then it's up to the drummer to to kind of play a little behind the beat and create that huge pocket so that that shuffling that the guitar player is doing sort of falls nicely in the middle and it's fat, but it's tight. So, yeah, that's yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I love it, it. it's yeah. a lifelong quest as a guitar player. It is a journey that you don't go on lightly. Right. I mean, nope. if you really if you want to observe and respect, you know, the the lineage of the music and find that way to emote it. It is it is something you'll never stop learning. I mean, the Keith no, Richards. No, and it's not. This, right? It's not just. I, I mean, yes, observe and respect, but but also you know, master. Right. That the path yeah. towards mastery it involves right. involves. It's the same thing. It's it's yeah. I mean, I I guess observing and respecting is is part of that, but it's also like, you're not going to do it right. Unless you, unless you really sit down and do it right. And, and I know we've all encountered, and I've been that musician sometimes, but you know, we've all encountered those musicians that are like, Oh yeah, let's do a blues jam. And then you're, you know, you get four bars in you're like, Oh, uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Yep. I see. All right. Level set. Okay. There's a way to have fun here. Let's have the fun. You know, let's find the, like no problem, but this isn't going to be that kind of blues jam. It's going to be this kind of blues jam. And that's okay. There you go. Yeah. 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 I agree. I, I do want to, I, I, I understand exactly the message that you are trying to convey when you say that steely dan is jazz for people that don't like real jazz um, <laughs> but i i can't i get and i get beat up on that all the time i can't agree with the words that you said but i i do agree with what i think you're trying to say there so i'm just going to leave it at that we don't need to dissect it unless you'd like to but i just had to kind of throw that out there for anybody that was banging on their steering wheel about that i uh, i was too <laughs> uh, your heart's in the right place i know what you mean <clears throat> but i think it i think steely dan's appeal is far broader than that very very narrow uh, description of I'll take one more yes. swing at it and say it's <laughs> it's for people who misequate complexity with quality. Sure, but I think there's a lot of quality to Steely Dan's music, and and I think that's that's perhaps no 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 I'm not I'm from. not I'm not I'm not saying that it's not jazz, and I'm not saying that it's not that it's not quality. I'm simply saying that the the misinterpretation that 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 gets my dander up is that because it's complex, it's good. Or because it's mm. complex, it's, it's, it's smarter or, or requires sophistication and taste or something like that. And, sure. you know, which is, you know, not what any music should be. Right. 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 Well, I mean, it, you, it, you either, you know it, if you like it, if you hear it, you're not, you're not holding it up to the light to some equation as to how many notes are being played or how many chords or how hard the chords are, or how hard the time signature is. That's not what makes music good. And I, I think that there's certain people who, and you know, it's, it's like people who, only buy for brand, regardless of actual quality of things. Like right. There's an assumption that if right. something is expensive, it's good. If something is complex in music, is it good? And, you know, that's up for every everybody to decide. But that premise is what kind of cloys at me. I, I got that. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we're right. wh while we're on the subject of, of ranting about things, we might as well at least acknowledge uh, what Mr. Neil Young uh, the foot that Mr. Neil Young seems to like to chew on in his mouth from time to time about technology. Last week he was on the verge cast with Neil Patel and Neil and you know, Neil Young has a long history of, of contradictions, quite honestly, where he rants about how, you know, technology is like digital recording specifically isn't, good and the only thing pure is analog recording and all that and so Neile brought up well you know the new MacBook Pro 16 inch has great uh you know has has a has great audio quality in it and Neil's response was that it was Fisher Price crap Th I, those are words that he said he didn't quite say it in exactly that order but that that is definitely what he meant uh, <laughs> to say 
And and then he went on and ranted about how, you know, the only thing that uh, that the only way you can really hear music is analog because it, it transmits the feeling and all of this. And, you know, I dug deep into this back, what, five years ago when uh, actually I, I don't I don't know if I can say that Neil Young was the reason that I dug into this, but uh, he might have been. I dug into this whole thing where he was ranting with that you know, ill-fated Pono player that died two, three years ago uh, that, you know, he's like, the only way to play digital music back is at 24 K 192 or whatever, you know, um, or 24 bits, 192 K. And, you know, he's just got to, he's just got to stop because he, I like, this is not about quality. This is not about, anything other than his uh, allegiance to his own past and trying to be relevant. And look, as someone who is still actively aging and is lucky enough to be in the category of actively aging, I understand, you know, worrying about waning relevance and all of that. But um, I don't know, man. He just like he beats this drum in the wrong way all of the time that well, it's kind of shaming in the way that he does it. It's, it's shaming. It's like, yeah. Can't you can't you see how stupid this is and how right I am? And again, you know, we're talking about Neil Young, right? No, no questions about the contributions he's made to our lives with amazing songs and totally. you know, culture shaping songs. You ne- we can't ever take that away. But yeah, nope. he did this originally on on. And I wonder, actually, can you stream Neil Young music on on Apple Music and Spotify? That's a great question. I will. I mean, look if he's that so up. concerned, if he's so concerned about the quality of the experience of the recording and the listening, I mean, would you want, not want people to be able to get your music in other formats? I mean, it's one thing to say it sounds better in, in one format rather than the other, but to say people shouldn't, or you know, or that you know, Neil Young I mean, is not on Apple Music. Um, okay. I, I could. Pres- I haven't. I don't have Spotify on this particular computer, so I can't look that up as easily. But I do not find him on Apple Music. But you know, the thing is, I I don't. I, so there, it's important when you when you get into all of this that truly the only way to know if something sounds better to you, and again, that is subjective at, at some level. You know, certainly. Uh, is to do what's called blind A-B texting, testing, or they call it A-B-X testing, where neither you nor, if there's a person administering the test, know which of the samples is being played, uh, you know, of the presumably of the same song, right? Uh, and, and that's the only way to do it. And the reason that's the only way to do it is because there is a very real thing that factors in called confirmation bias. And what confirmation bias is, Is if you know that if you've convinced yourself that you like, for example, vinyl better than, you know, any other format or you've convinced yourself that you like the sound of your speakers better than my speakers or any other speakers. Great. Okay. if you know that you are listening on your speakers, your brain will actually make it sound better to you. The pleasure centers in your brain will fire more. If you based on factors external to what's actually coming out of the speakers, right? If you know in your mind that these speakers are better than those speakers, then you will like truly like those speakers better. And so that's confirmation bias. So you have to eliminate that from the equation and all cues of that from the equation in order to truly test. And when it comes to, you know, like like analog versus digital, especially uncompressed digital, uh, there are no humans that can tell the difference reliably. It's usually people usually get it right about 50 percent of the time, which when you're doing an A-B test is pretty much, you know, as good as a guess. Uh, even between. CD or or even better than CD quality, I mean, there's a lot of people that say that humans can hear better than CD quality, which is also not necessarily true. Um, again, not proven by A-B testing, but uh the difference between, say, uncompressed audio and compressed, like, you, you know, Spotify uses 320K BPS MP3s. Apple Music uses 256K BPS um, AACs, which is Apple's format. Uh, hearing the difference between those is not always possible. I have trained myself 
to hear the difference on certain tracks. And my favorite example is Kathy's Waltz from Dave Brubeck's Time Out album. There are sections of that song where I have trained myself to be able to hear the difference between the AAC 256 and the, you know, and the, the uncompressed uh, master, even, the, you know, the analog master, whatever you want to be. Uh, but it, 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 I don't find either of them, you know, any less pleasurable. It's just like, if I listen really hard that, you know, that, that album, that timeout album was recorded so well, man. And it, you know, you hear so much of the air in the room and, and it's in those spaces where there's air left that you can kind of hear it cut off a little bit uh, because of the compression. Whereas the uncompressed one, you don't, you know, there's like a little bit of like room reverb that, that sticks around in very certain spots of the song, but otherwise, you know, it's really hard to tell the difference. And especially with, with modern music, the way that compression like uh, dynamic compression is apl applied that you don't, you know, it, it all kind of fits uh, where it needs to fit. So, um, I don't know what's up with Neil. I, you know, I just wish he would, he would not come out and say these things because like you said, he, as an artist, he's very well respected. I, I don't care to hear him sing his own songs or anybody's songs for that matter, but, but I'm with you. Like there's no arguing about his place in the history of rock and roll. There's no arguing about his, his abilities as a songwriter. I, I would argue about his capabilities as a singer, but that's very subjective. And I've already admitted that I like Getty Lee. So, you know, I, I get it. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things, man. If you've got a, if you've got a computer and you're recording your music, keep recording your music. Like don't yeah. stop just because Neil Young doesn't like it. I think if Neil Young, if we could take that MacBook pro and go back to 1966 and give that to the engineer that was in the studio when he was recording that Buffalo Springfield album, I guarantee you a Neil had zero say over what gear was used that day. And B, Neil would wax poetic today, anachronistically, <laughs> about that MacBook Pro and how awesome it was and the great career that it gave him and all of that stuff. I, you know, there's just too much baggage in any of this. And also, Neil's even admitted that his hearing is shot. So I really doubt he's able to hear anything, you know, above maybe 10K at this point. So I would only connect all the dots here and say that existentially, the reason Neil gave us some some of the most amazing songs in the history of rock and roll is because he is that badass who is who is in insistent upon his worldview and opinion yes like that's 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 what into making him write you know old man and you know several other amazing songs uh so you get both with neil and you sometimes you get yeah yeah i mean right. he could just as well be talking about you know i guess i guess it's fair he's he is an expert to some degree of his opinion in this area, you know, he's not talking about, you know, blowing glass or something like that. But uh, I think, you know, there's a certain OK Boomer aspect to this where, <laughs> you know, life, yeah. life move, has, is moving on. The upside of putting a recording studio in everybody's palm, you know, or on everybody's desktop, you know, makes it more available for more people to find their art and get it out to the world and, and those types of things. And would you make that trade off? I mean, how many people, I mean, we couldn't make do sense. this. We couldn't be right. doing this if, if we were limited to analog and we couldn't right. be doing this if we were limited to only releasing things in, you know, uncompressed quality. So yeah, fair, you know, yeah. <sighs> All hey right, man. so Steely Dan and Neil Young, we both, uh, we, <laughs> today is the negative episode, right? Yeah, so let me ask if there's any negative impacts to you of this whole AB5 oh. thing in California, right? Wow. So, well, and so for people that don't know, and this, this is, what AB5 is, is it's a, a new law in California that falls under the realm of classifying people that do work as employees Instead of independent contractors in a, in the, in sort of the, the grand scheme of things, it is yet another piece of legislation that does this. And, and California is obviously the, the, the you know, the uh, the example here. But we've seen these kinds of things before. In fact, we talked about them on the show before. I had that one theater that was not following the uh, the National uh, Labor Bureau's guidelines that uh, theater pit musicians are classified as employees. And the, the, you know, the IRS, if you're in any other line of work the and, and you misclassify someone 
as a contractor instead of an employee, you're you're subject to some pretty severe potential penalties. Mm. And and the 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 criteria are pretty easy to go through. Right. It's you know, do you get to control Do you as the person who is, you know, contracting for to have the work done? Uh, are you in control of how the person does the work, when the person does the work, what the work, it, you know, what like specifically oh, how they do it, uh, what they let's wear. back up a little bit here. Let, let's yeah. back up a little bit. OK. All right. So for most of us who have a, who play in a band, most wait, of wait, us. Let, me, let me finish the IRS thing, because it really like it'll help frame this conversation. Right. Like okay. all of the right. So if you if you get to choose when they do the work, how they do the work, uh when they get to take breaks, what they get to wear, like then there's more criteria. But if 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 you hit really even just one or two of those, that person is an employee, not a contractor. So if I hire you to build a desk for me and I tell you I want a desk that that has, you know, a, a top on it and you say, great, you know, and the top is this size. Great. And 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 you say that'll cost a thousand bucks. And I say, cool, deliver it, you know, whenever you're done. That's a contractor relationship. But if I hire you to build a desk and say, great, we build desks here. Come into my office. You, you work from nine to five. You're going to be paid hourly to do this, to build this desk, you know, and and when you're here, you get to take breaks. You, know, you get a lunch break from noon to one. And like as soon as I start doing that, now you're my employee. And when you're an employee, you got to pay workers. The employer has to pay workers comp and and, uh, you know, is disability responsible insurance. for taxes and disability and all that. So that's the that's sort of the umbrella that's over this whole thing. And now there's this new AB5 thing in California that is targeting this presumably because of the uh, the ride, like the, the gig economy, right? The, the ride sharing companies and right. those sorts of things. They're like, wait, these people are being called contractors. Really, there's too much control being exerted by the Ubers and the Lyfts of the world. Mm, they're employees. And that, you know changes some things for them, but collateral damage here is musicians. So sorry. Thank you for indulging me in, in that Absolutely. Sort of, it, the description. So let's back up here. So I'm, I'm going to gather most of the people listening to this uh, podcast is this kind of semi-professional. Most of you have a day job, right. you know, and you do this as kind of a, some, something from a pure hobby to an emphasized hobby, you know, that you put a lot of time into it, you know, you may even have made it a small business somehow, but, but previously a large part of your life, if you're a band leader is you go get the money from the, from the venue, the check, you cash the check, you put it in the bank, whatever you do. And then you pay out some agreed upon rate of things, your relationship as a band leader or, you know, or the guy in a democratic, uh, democratic band as the payer of people um, was just like, we're split it. Here's your part. Yep. Yes. This bill comes along in California. It was actually signed back in September. And then all of a sudden, around mid-October, all of a sudden, I start seeing things in my Facebook news feed and in various other things I read that says, this could be the death of the music industry in California. What? The death of the music industry. And so you go on to read a little bit. And yes, this labor law was, was signed by the governor of California in September to go into effect on January 1st, 2020, ostensibly the issue has been to, um, to address gig workers. They were going after Uber and Lyft who they felt, you know, this, the Congresswoman state assembly person who wrote this bill was like, no, those people deserve benefits. And, you know, remember right. it's not, it's not an illicit thing on, on the surface of it. It's like, no, you know, if someone gets hurt, they should have, they should have, um, you know, disability insurance and a lot of those things that an employer, because it's an employment relationship. However, the bill was crafted really softly and 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 immediately, like I said, starting in October, you start seeing this could be the death of the music industry, because now, according to this bill, no longer is it just, OK, the gig's over. Here's your 50 bucks. Here's your 100 bucks, whatever it may be. Now it's like, all right, you're an employee. If you're a band leader your bandmates are employees of the guy who is, who's get the check is made out to. It actually even goes further that it, there's certain ways that this can be interpreted. And again, it, the, the criticism is that it's written really poorly. Yeah. We don't know. It hasn't been tested in court yet, which is why right. th this is all still up in the air. Yeah. 
venues can be considered an employer of the band if if sure. music is if music is cannot be deemed as some very particularly unusual thing that this you know does if a bar offers live music and that's part of what it does they can't say nope we sell drinks for a living no what you do is you you know you sell admission for people to come in yeah, and if, if you know, a, that's right if a bar charges a cover because there's a band playing that would be an arguable could be could, could be. be right yeah that, that arguably could be that yeah there's a there's a thing in the irs rules and i'm sure it's in this too that if the if the activity that this you know contractor slash employee is performing falls under the usual course of the the business entities, you know, ongoing business, then that person's an employee. So if we don't make desks here and I hire you to buy a desk, it's way easier for me to say you're a contractor than if we do make desks here. And I say, I want you to buy, build me a desk. It's like, oh, well, wait a minute. You make desks like this is a thing that you do. And in and in this case, if they're charging a cover that they argued that it could be argued that that that's yep. your normal business. Yeah. Could be argued. So, like I said, starting in October, I start to see these posts, articles, the death of the music industry if this happens. So what does it mean? It means literally that um, somebody has to pay the employment taxes for the delivery of, of live music. Now, also starting the beginning of October, or middle of October, when I start seeing these, I start getting quasi experts starting to weigh in. There's no way that they will enforce this. It's, it's unenforceable. Um, it'll be tested in court or it will, will never be enforced was one opinion I saw. Other people started to freak out. And as of the 1st of January, some decisions were made. There were two local opera companies that that did not, chose not to have um, live music for their performances and went to recorded music because they didn't want to have musicians on their payroll. So people are sort of freaking out about it. And then really what's interesting is um, there's there's three or four big booking guys here, right? And again, booking people are part of this whole equation. Are, are, are the band leaders, if you get paid through the booking guy, is the booking guy an employer or, you know, just a pass through or what does that mean? So they're freaking out quite a bit as well. And they have a they have various opinions about how it'll end up. But they all are saying, wave the red flag. This is a concern you have to deal with. So January 1st comes and goes. I know no bands that have changed their course of business over this yet. OK, the, the expectation uh, and I'm going to get to this in a second. The expectation is that the um, assemblywoman who authored the bill has been meeting with people to understand how to amend her language, the I impact it will have on the general gig economy. Again, it's not just musicians, it's artists of all kinds that work on a gig basis. It's actors, it's sculptors, it's painters, it's it's anybody who works. Oh, on that's a, right. You know, I, I would right? guess that Hollywood is also very concerned. And I, I use Hollywood to say the film industry, wherever it resides in California. But I, I could see that being a huge, uh, hugely impacted population. Yeah. And there was one story of, uh, you know, uh, like a uh, music for TV that w is not hiring California musicians to to do their oh. recordings. They went out of state. So people are freaking out right now. The general con interest tact uh, that people are taking is that it, the language will be amended. However, in the last couple of weeks, there's been um, a fair amount of reporting that the woman who authored the bill first, she said she told uh, some musicians rights organizations, well, give me the language that you want. Now, a that seems weird to me that she shouldn't do her own research. And, you know, yeah, but that's how bill. that's how bills are. Bills are written by more legal language is written by lobbyists than actual lawmakers. Uh, people Fair with enough. the title of lawmakers. So in a sense, she's asking for that to happen even though like those particular groups probably aren't all that used to writing laws, <laughs> but, but right, it is kind of so how I'll, that works. But I'll tell you this. Yeah. So here's where we are for, for musicians is, is um, there's one guy in California who has built a business as kind of a musician's advocate. Like he's written books, sure. how to make it in the music industry. His name is Ari and he has a, a website called Ari's take. I'll, I'll share the, okay. And he's, you know, shared some specific, he's actually gone and met with the woman and, you know, kind of pitched his, mm -hmm his uh, his issues. And she said, you know, give me the language. Unfortunately, also who has met with um, the assembly person is is musicians unions in California. Mm -hmm. And where I understand things to be right now is the language that 
the lawyers of the musicians unions it has submitted is not suitable for the independent musician, whether this is a an angle that musicians unions are taking to coerce people to join musicians unions. I don't really understand that. That's what my first thought would be about why they're so different. But um, that's what's happening now is is the reporting is that the language that there is being driven by the people with the most money and the, you know, the most impact, which are union organizations and sure. that it's still not going to be great for independent musicians. So right, I so guess I net, have, net, okay. net, yeah. All right, net, net, it's a real thing. Um, you have to assume at this point in time, it's law and that it, 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 it you have to, why would you roll the dice? Assume it's not going to be enforced. Um, the hope is for, uh, some kind of a carve out or exclusion that describes musicians as exempt from this. If, if you know, and the, the assembly person seem to be open to this concept, sure. but the battle for that language is causing a new level of consternation now. Well, yeah, well, wait, because it unions, when, when this came up with the national labor board, with the, um, with the whole theater thing, the musicians union sided with the IRS. They're like, absolutely. Musicians should be paid as employees, especially. And I think you might find where, that this needs to be a little more nuanced because the opera slash theater world, right, where people are playing the same gig for a longer period of time. It's not that you're just booked for a night. You're booked for, you know, in the theater world, even a, a, a short run at community theater might be five weekends or five weeks, really. And so that's very different than play, asking you to play from seven to ten on a, you know, on a Thursday night. So so that language might actually you, you, there might need to be a divide there. Uh, because unions are there to protect their people. And one of the things that that, I, you know, would worry me if I were a band leader is the the whole idea of rolling these dice. And let's say, you know, I'm on a gig and I've got, you know, whatever, my band of, of four other guys and one of them slips and falls right on the gig and hurts themselves enough that they incur some expenses. OK, now that person consults an attorney. And that attorney says, well, workers comp should cover you. And that person says, well, I'm a contractor. There's no workers comp. He says, oh, no, no, no. Oh, uh, no, no. Yeah. Oh, no, no. You're a I can point to AB5 and say definitively that you're an employee. Let's take your band leader to court. And that person now has chosen to be, you know, I mean, can be painted, even if they're the nicest guy in the world, like Mr. Paul Kent here, you know, in court, anybody, anybody can be painted to be the villain. And you're like, oh, look at you weren't even taking care of your people and this, that, and this guy got hurt. You're not even you don't have any even have them insured. And now, boom, they're coming after you. Right. So, yep. uh, you know, this is where that 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 nebulousness of the risk comes from and why it's important, I think, to, you know, organize your band as an LLC so that you have some layer, even if your LLC gets sued, you know, in, unless it's unless it can be proven to be true negligence, generally speaking, the corporate veil doesn't get pierced there. So you don't get, you don't, you know, your house doesn't start to be the thing that people are coming after yeah. and that, that kind of stuff. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I can see that, that this is, I can see why people are a little gun shy right now because until well, it's more it's than gun shy, gun shy was, was approaching the first of the year. And then after the mm. first of the year, now, now I'd say that the red flags are waving pretty good. Yeah. And so, so in my band, I started in October making my guys aware, right. Sharing on our Slack channel, all every single article about this, where it's going. Smart. We had our first rehearsal of the year in January. And I said, Hey guys, you know, this is a thing. And, um, you know, my intention now is to, is to wait until the end of February and see if the language gets addressed um, but if it doesn't, there's a lot of risk going on here, you know, a lot of financial risk. And, you know, like you said, there's there's property risk as well. What I wish would happen. So. So. And actually, to extract that a little bit, what this means really is for that hundred dollar gig. Um, like one of my guys said, well, you know, so if you have to take care of it, taxes are taken out. We're all good. Right. It's not quite that simple. It's not that right? simple. Yeah. A, For anybody that's, that's run a business before, you know that it's, it's not quite that simple. Yeah, that's right. And then one of my guys 
is uh, he's incorporated as an LLC. He's formed an LLC and he, you know, he sends me an invoice and I pay it. And, you know, that's, that's covered. That's cool. But it's, you know, probably not practical for every musician to form an LLC. Maybe, even, maybe. Even if, even in that scenario, I mean, th- like it's clear that the two of you are in full agreement as to the fact that this is a contractor relationship and all that, but that doesn't matter to the court. Like the court can say, okay, but the real, the reality is the law says that it's this. And just because that person has created a corporate entity, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. And the law is the law. And so that person is an employee like that. I've seen that happen. Not, not in the music business. I haven't, I haven't considered that. That, but I've definitely seen that happen in, you know, in, in sort of general business uh, for sure, you know, where it's like, no, well, that, that's it doesn't matter. And the IRS is really your interpretation. Yeah. Your interpretation of the law doesn't matter here. You know, right. here's the IRS's lawyer, you know, gonna, is going to state what we have. And it's how good your lawyer is versus how good their lawyer Correct. is. And I guess that, that that's a scary fact of life in, in many things. Right. But <laughs> yes, it, exactly. but it's also, you know, in all for many of the guys, you know, forming an LLC is a minimum eight hundred dollars a year plus tax returns, plus you know some other things. That's and, right. You Californians and, have that. I have to pay that stupid eight hundred dollar a year franchise tax because i have one employee that chooses yep. to live in california i don't care if he lives in bolivia <laughs> and i explained that to your taxing authority and they were like cool you mean so, you have one contractor who lives in california no oh, that's that's what i would like to have as a contractor that lives in california because then i wouldn't have to pay your uh, franchise taxes but i do yeah. so yes i wish i only wish it's like you know i'm your unpaid steward I collect the taxes from your residents and I give them to you and I get nothing in return other than the privilege of paying the state yeah. eight, a minimum of 800 bucks a year. Anyway, that's, so yeah. the, the, the wrap to this again, we will probably come back to this as, as it evolves. But the wrap to this is now that hundred dollar gig, um, you know, I'm going to have the co- if, if I choose to if we all choose to you know progress this. Now, my cost of business to add on my side of the employment taxes is pick a number, 20 bucks, you know, for you or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, And so you're going to get that hundred bucks, less your taxes taken out, less. It's not a hundred bucks anymore. It's 80 bucks because I need to keep 20 of it to cover the cost of. So to pay the other, to pay the taxes. What what previously would, it's not extra taxes, right? It's that, you know, if you're self-employed right now, you pay your regular income taxes, and then you pay self-employment taxes on that. If Paul now becomes your, like, let's say I'm, I'm one of your band members right now, you give me a hundred bucks out of that hundred. I have to pay my, my income taxes and then self-employment taxes. If you become my employer, I no longer have to pay my self-employment taxes, but you do. Those are called employer taxes, right? And so you have to take that 15 or 20 bucks out of that hundred to pay those. And then I pay another 15 or 20 bucks out of that hundred to pay mine. And right. that's, that's just how that works. Yeah. So is everybody in agreement that this hundred buck gig is now you may get 60, you know, whatever the number is going to be. And then you can do your taxes at the end of the year and figure out what you can write out and figure out what you, what you can get back on, on all this type of stuff. But, yep. you know, the, you know, the concept that, that a small band leaders will want to go to that hassle B that uh, it, musicians who live gig to gig can do without the money up front uh, in the hopes that, you know, that they, they've done some calculation that the, that their, their um, write-offs will somewhat balance some yeah. of the things that they you right so yeah. so that's a calculation most musicians do so that's a problem what i what i wish would happen and this those would be calculations go against your self employment taxes if you're an if you're a contractor so which which is great right because it can reduce your overall burden if right. if you're an employee those write offs at best only go against your federal income or your income taxes which would include the state but the self employment part that became the employer taxes that's gone. You don't you don't get to ask for some of that back. Neither does your employer. That's just gone. Right. Yeah. And and again, we probably should state emphatically here that we are not tax people and that, you know, we're giving our opinion on things and we're not sure. advising anybody on how to do stuff. I think it's important. No, it is. We, we 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 have a lot of experience with this, but we, we can only uh, we can only incriminate ourselves here. So That's we right. can't we can't incriminate you. So, yeah. Check what with I think someone would be cool if, this, yeah. if nothing changes here, though. I'd like to think that there'd be something like a like a temp agency service that would that would 
open that um, all musicians, you know, can register with this temp service and you would be an employee of them. So yep. musicians for hire Inc. And uh, and band leaders could just pay them and then they can take care of the taxes because, you know, I, it's two I things. I propose that idea, though. I propose that in our well, there's been a discussion in our Gig Gab Facebook group about this. And I proposed exactly that idea like, hey, there's an opportunity for some enterprising individual or individuals to create, you know, this kind of thing. And there was there's an attorney in the group and he shot it down. He's like, no. He's like, you would still there would the, like all these same problems would still happen up the chain, assuming that your musicians are p- playing at clubs that now are have to treat musicians as employees. You know, you don't get to put this 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 theoretical veil in between that. It's still like it, it's worth reading his commentary. I, ha- I haven't read it in, a, in, I don't know, several weeks, so I don't have it fresh on my mind. But but that. It, as great as I like that idea too, I, there were some questions about it. So yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And, and it, I would only add to that that it just opens up the can of worms because the bill is written so loosely. So yeah. you know, you and I both know that a lot of the tech companies that we do business with, um, they make you be an, a quote unquote contractor for um, a year or two before they will consider giving you full time employment. So they hire you know Fred's temporary services. All employees must go through them, and Fred you know, pays their taxes and Google, you know, company X pays Fred, Fred pays, you right. know, right. right. Um, you know, but they're a hundred percent of the time they're, they're at company X. And so, you know, there are all sorts of tests that can happen with this stuff all the time. Again, us poor musicians are like a low hanging fruit. You really, that you get this amount of hassle for most guys taking a hundred bucks a gig, which yeah. is going to, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not belittling that there are professional musicians that are 500 bucks a gig. That's not my point here. My point here is that overwhelmingly this net goes over, goes over many, many industries and many, you know, fairly low paying, low compensated. It adds a level of complexity, a level of cost that um, is really difficult for to handle. And so I go back to those, you know, articles, the death of the music industry in California. Could you imagine if you couldn't play music in a bar because of, of government inspired labor laws? Yeah. Can you imagine that? Isn't that crazy? But, and yet that like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, it's crazy, man. So So, yeah, if you folks have any thoughts or if you've experienced, I'm really curious what the, the material impact of this is. So if anybody's had any, please write us, you know, feedback at giggabpodcast.com and I'll find that link to the discussion that we had in the in the Facebook group about this, too. But we'd love to hear from you about it. Uh, this is, you know, I like I said at the start of this discussion, I this is currently happening in California. But there have been little pockets of this sort of creeping up in many different places. You know, the one I mentioned in Boston with the theater is only one. There are several others that that kind of flare up here and there. And and it's it's in large part because the IRS themselves has been cracking down on this over the past, certainly the past decade uh, where the you know, like you said, Paul, there's a lot of companies that are taking liberties with the definition of employee versus contractor to their benefit. And, you know, the IRS and the labor board are there, the labor board, especially to protect employees from getting screwed, Uh, you know, and if somebody's truly an employee. They're there to say, no, no, you got to treat them like an employee. And and right. as someone that employs people in lots of businesses here, I, I, I actually side with the labor board more than I side with the, you know, the, the, against them because you do need to take care of your people and you do need, you know, to Im- impose some unnecessary headache on an employee or to, to put them at unnecessary risk. Like, I get it. Like, we got to take care of our people. I mean, I, I want to do that selfishly so that they want to keep working for me. I mean, it's like, but where it gets weird is this, where it's like, oh, we're going to impose all that headache on this for, a, like you said, for a $100 gig or even for a $500 gig. It's like, oh, man, what a headache. The, and the, so, the tremendous irony here is Uber and Lyft are going to throw massive legal dollars at at getting themselves excluded from this and proving their point that they're not and i would bet they're going to win and us musicians may end up on the short end of it yes right right that's the problem is it's not going to be the simplest uh thing and it's not going to be built for us unless unless it is and let's hope that the musicians union 
Uh, they may not come up with the answer that we want, which generally is, you know, we're humans. We experience change resistance. So leave it the same. You know, we got used to this. Let's leave it alone. It, that I, I think that ship has probably sailed. But let's hope that the musicians union can come up with something that's actually good for musicians, even if it does require us to adapt a little bit. So. And I had asked you before we decided to tackle this topic, I said, you know, this is a California thing. Do you think it, it's interesting to our listeners in Italy and, and, you know, in all of the places? And you thought that, you know, you had said there are laws that like this that happen from time to time, statewide, federally, IRS wise, you know, yeah. and that's why this is important for all musicians to understand the topic. Yeah, no, it is. It Well, you should understand employment law anyway, because you, you want to make sure to protect yourself either. As as the person playing the instrument, as the person hiring people to play instruments like all of it, it, it really it's not the kind of thing where putting your head in the sand and ignoring that this stuff exists is going to end well. It's best to just be informed is, is really what it comes down to. So that that's why I wanted to cover it here. So thank you for indulging us on that. And really, truly feedback at getgabpodcast.com. Thank you for you know sending along your comments and everything. We got a lot more to talk about. So I guess we got to do this again next week, Paul. I'm on. All right. Sweet. Well, folks, thanks for listening. We will be here next week as it turns out. And uh, we'll see you then. Cool, man. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Paul. Hey, always be, even if you're an employee, always be performing. (laughs) I'm going to get a shirt that says that. (laughs) I like it.